enormous pleasure to see you all gathered here. And um, to Rosalind, I cast my mind back too to the young one at the piano singing songs in the Georgian drawing room. And I remember turning to Nora Lieber at the time and saying, that one has it. History proved me very right, didn't it? Yeah. So Rosalind, God bless you and thank you very much. Many thanks I have to give Sean, publishers, to Jonathan, to Anne. She has been mentioned before. She was of great um, help to me, an enormous help to me in the tough work of getting photographs together and all that sort of thing. I also want to make a point. A fella came in. When you call him a fella, it means the story mightn't be all that. <laughs> a fellow came in and sat down and the book was lying on the table and he looked at it and he turned it over and he saw my name on it and he said, did you write it? <laughs> so I assured him that I haven't the high skills of footballers who can knock off an autobiography at half time. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you now something that gave um, about the period from which I come way back and when I went into the theatre and um, they it will explain of course why the the name of the book is I never had a proper job because anyone of my ilk in the theatre knows that that was the same people who say oh yeah 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 uh, you're in the Abbey are you? when are you going to get a proper job <laughs> well known to actors anyway let me let me tell you something when I, I, I left school and I was decided at that time, my family, that I could be an actor, uh, not an actor, anything but an actor. Uh, I could be a solicitor or a doctor or something like that. Nothing appealed to me. I finally decided, I gave in and said, all right, I'll be a dentist. The reason I wanted to be a dentist or preferred to be a dentist was that I thought that looking into the cavity of open mouths would be less objectionable than looking into the cavities of open stomachs. <laughs> so I was sent off to Cork University and I'll tell you something of that. Um, I was in digs in the Clashine Road. I had an uncle and aunt, uncles and aunts all over the city. They were my mother's relations. She said they'd look after me. I never doubted it for one moment. My landlady's name was Nettie. Mrs. Cremon to her lodgers. She was small and plump, with a single protruding tooth where a rubber set had once been. Her sitting room bore the, the scars of long student tenancy, shaky chairs, a cracked mirror, and dust. Dust everywhere, like a skim of desert sand. A tap on the table cover raised a grey plume of dust, a slap with an open hand and left an imprint of thumb and forefinger. <laughs> it wasn't that Nelly didn't work. She never stopped. But the um, she never stopped. Now, in digs with me there were two uh, students. One, Le uh, Liam, he was a rugby footballer and a, an interprovincial player, and the other was Sean, who was studying to be a doctor. Liam gave me advice, and it was very solid advice. He said, never miss a lecture. Take plenty of notes. A month before the exam, Revise like a whore. <laughs> the rest of the time you can ask around all you like. <laughs> now, Sean said to him, about him, never stuck an exam. Friggin' honours too. I am... Um, I want to prop this up because it's uh, Ah, God bless you. I decided that I too would get honours. I would study like a whore, and in my final year, some impressionable first year would look at me and think, honours, 
friggin' honors. <laughs> Exalted by dreams of academic distinction, I laid out my textbooks and planned a work schedule to the wall. But I couldn't work. I tried and failed. I tried again and failed again. Every day I vowed that tomorrow I would start. Every weekend that I would begin for sure next Monday. I drifted from picture house to bookshop, killing time. I read every, every man classic that was available. I read into the small hours, indifferent to the bleary-eyed next morning when I would stare from Nellie's window, hoping for a miracle that would release me from my lassitude. Astoundingly, it happened. In the middle of the day, slap bang, just like that, when I was crossing the quadrangle in the University in Cork. Into my ear, a still, small voice whispered in tones that were loud and clear. You won't be a dentist, it said. You will tread the boards and posture in the spotlight's beams. I walked on water. I bestrode the universe, confident that my parents would be equally elated by my decision I wrote home. <laughs> Florid phrases flowed from my pen in what seemed to me a masterpiece of emotional expression. I even thought of keeping a reply from my autobiography. <laughs> In reply, I expected a letter, not that two days later my parents would knock on Nellie's door. The interview that followed was painful. My mother remained silent. My father asked the questions. How did I expect to make a decent living on the stage? Had I not seen poor devils of show people dragging around the country without a soul on their shoes or a rag on their backs? Would I, when I retired, would I have a pension? <laughs> Discussion lasted for three days, after which I agreed to remain on in college until the end of the academic year. It seemed no more than a small sacrifice to please my parents. A few months, that was all, and I would be on my way. <clears throat> Far from it. When I reached home at the end of term, I believe that my university career had ended. But before I knew where I was, a prospectus tumbled through the letterbox and discussions proceeded about finding a different course for next year. Something I would find more appealing than dentistry. I would not return to Cork. I would attend University College Dublin. A fresh start. My frustration at wasting yet another year in university turned into resentment against my parents. Unreasonably, I blamed them for impeding my progress towards the theatre. Self-pity is a comfortable funk hole. I pined for the theatre but did nothing about it, except once. On impulse, I wrote to Lord Longford at the gate, requesting an interview. A few days later, a reply arrived, summoning me to the Gaiety, where Longford productions were in performance. Lord Longford was a large, overweight man. He was friendly, a little nervous, courteous. He questioned me about my age and my experience, and asked if I was intending to join the professional theatre. Yes, I said, yes, Lord Longford. Then I suppose you should do something for me. I had come prepared. My gr the great speech from Marlowe's Faustus, no less. I would impress, I would have make impact. Not for nothing had I shaken the walls of home, the sitting room at home in Mullingar, when our house was empty. Facing Lord Longford, I filled my lungs and let rip like an overcharged fairground barker. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? <laughs> and Lord Longford stirred uneasily. <laughs> and there's no need to speak so loudly. There only needs <laughs> and I thought I'd got off to a flying stop. <laughs> I tried again. What emerged was the rasping of a medium in a trance. 
I thought the speech would never end. At last I got there. The devil will come and Faustus will be damned. A long silence. And Lord Longford cleared his throat. I don't remember anyone doing Faustus for me before. No one. <laughs> never. Silence. <laughs> and uh, you want to be a professional actor? <laughs> yes, Lord Longford. Ah, I see. Ah, yeah. Uh, Lord Longford, would you like me to do another piece for you? <laughs> In an instant, Lord Longford was on his feet. The curtain is coming down, I need to go backstage. Thank you, thank you. The backstage stairs in the gaiety are stone and cheerless. Halfway down, I glance back. Lord Longford was in the dressing room door, gazing after me. Our eyes met. He fled for cover. <laughs> <laughs> Dreams of the theatre filled my days and nights. I had no idea how to get started, but luck was on my side when I spotted a newspaper advertisement for a school of acting to be run in the Gaiety Theatre under the guidance of the Abbey actress, Rhea Mooney. My father was non-committal when I said I'd applied, but he wished me good luck when I was called for interview. My interview was surprisingly brief. Did I want to be a professional actor or to do the course for fun? To be a professional, Miss Mooney, and I wanted to study production. Ah, said Rhea, that's, I've only a few who want to be producers. An encouraging remark, but I went home, not daring to hope. After a couple of anxious weeks, word arrived that I'd been accepted for the school. <coughs> My father was resigned. If that is what you want, he said, your mother and I won't stand in your way. I would have supported you until you got a degree in the university. I will support you for the same length of time until you get on your feet. No more generous offer could be made by a parent who must have felt let down. It couldn't have been easy for my parents. They were conventional people, sure of their place in small town society, in a town in a time when loose living Hollywood scandalized propriety, when films were censored and a play could whistle up a storm of outrage. To have their only son abandon a university career for the uncertainties of the stage must have been the bitterest of pills for them to swallow. The summer was buoyant days of waiting for autumn and the school of acting to open. At last the day arrived when I was to leave. But before I was on my way, a shock awaited, and from where I least expected it. My bag was packed, my sister Tony was waiting to accompany me to the station, my father had wished me well. I turned to my mother to bid her goodbye. It is not our fault, she said. Your father and I did our best. <laughs> I was thunderstruck. My father tried to intervene, but she went on. After all, we did for him. Going around the country like a tinker. <laughs> Since the first discussions in Cork about my wish to become an actor, I had taken for granted that my mother's silence indicated that she was on my side. Not for a moment had I suspected her disapproval. I won't go, I cried, I'll stay at home. Dramatics. <laughs> Even as I spoke, I knew that to resist the call of the theater would be a kind of suicide. My sister Tony kept her head. Grabbing my suitcase, she dragged me from the kitchen. In the station, she bought a baby power and stuffed it in my pocket. <laughs> She'll get over it, she said. On the train, I knocked back the baby power and bought another. When I reached Westland Row, I was in the clouds. Grandly, I tipped a porter sixpence to carry my bags and walked ahead of him up the platform. At the barrier, 
I handed over my one-way ticket, lit a cigarette, and emerged into the city. I was on my way at last. A life in the theater lay ahead. <laughs> The legs are gone, the eyes are gone after them. <laughs> the, um, that is a compression of a, lo a longer section in the book, uh, which is about, as uh, has been said, about my time in the professional theatre. I emphasise that because I spent many, a lot of time doing amateur drama, but there's a certain limit, of, uh, uh, limit on the number of words that can be used. It is also about my parents, my growing up, as Rosalind mentioned, and it is about my wife, Nancy, particularly about her and uh, my marriage to her. I thank everyone who is here. I thank all of you for coming. And I think that's all I have to say now, except to say I remember the young one at the piano in the Georgian room. <laughs> and that the rest for her was history, and the rest for me was a life of great interest and diversity and no regrets. Thank you. <laughs>